this week's source is called Wake Up Lovers by Rumi. And this poem was read at mine and Matthew's, my husband's wedding. And the reason I chose it was is that I've been experimenting with having the source find me rather than me find the source. And for some reason, I think the cleaner had been shifting something around on the windowsill and the poem had is in a frame basically and it had been just shoved onto the dining table and I thought oh and so I said oh Matthew should I just read this poem to you and so we read it again and it was so gorgeous to read it and feel why why it was chosen and feel so aligned with the conversation that we are in here in turning towards life as well and such an invitation into something beyond some beyondness that's so supportive of the of the here-ness and so that's why I thought it would be a really nice source for us to have so um why don't I read this we do this the other way around to the way we wouldn't ordinarily do it Lizzie you chose the source but I'll read it first mm -hmm. so this is called wake up lovers and it's uh, a poem by Rumi Wake up, lovers. It is time to start the journey. We have seen enough of this world. It's time to see another. These two gardens may be beautiful, but let us pass beyond them and go to the gardener. Let us kiss the ground and flow like a river towards the ocean. Let us go from the valley of tears to the wedding feast. Let us bring the colour of blossoms to our pale faces. Our hearts shiver like autumn leaves about to fall. In this world of dust, there is no avoiding pain or feeling exiled. Let us become like beautifully coloured birds and fly to the sweet land of paradise. Everything is painted with the brush of the invisible one. Let us follow the hidden signs and find the painter. It is best to travel with companions on this perilous journey. Only love can lead the way. We are like rain splashing on a roof. Let us find our way down the spout. We are like an arched bow with the arrow in place. Let us become straight and release the arrow towards the target. We have stayed at home scared like mice. Let us find our courage and join the lions. Let our souls turn into a mirror, longing to reflect the essence of beauty. Let us begin the journey home. Wake up, lovers. Wake up, lovers. It's time to start the journey. We have seen enough of this world. It's time to see another. These two gardens may be beautiful, let us pass beyond them and go to the gardener. Let us kiss the ground and flow like a river towards the ocean. Let us go from the valley of tears to the wedding feast. Let us bring the colour of blossoms to our pale faces. Our hearts shiver like autumn leaves about to fall. In this world of dust, there is no avoiding pain or feeling exiled. Let us become like beautifully coloured birds and fly to the sweet land of paradise. Everything is painted with the brush of the invisible one. Let us follow the hidden signs and find the painter. It is best to travel with companions on this perilous journey, where only love can lead the way. We are like rain splashing on a roof. Let us find our way down the spout. We are like an arched bow with the arrow in place. Let us become straight and release the arrow toward the target. We have stayed at home scared like mice. Let us find our courage and join the lions. Let our souls turn into a mirror, longing to reflect the essence of beauty. Let us begin the journey home. Oh my goodness, do I need this poem today. Mm. And I, I've done a, a little experiment here, Lizzie, which is um, I didn't read the source before this morning. Very often, when one of us chooses, I read and I'm sort of soaked in it before we begin. So 
So I just want to say one small thing and which is um, I want to pick up on this uh, line, well, on all of it, but the Rumi says near the end, we've stayed at home scared like mice. Mm. One of the things I know about myself, I know Lizzie, you and I have talked about this many times, and I've probably talked about this a bit here on Turning Towards Life, is one of the things I know about myself, but I think it's true of so many people, is that we so easily feel our smallness and our separateness and our vulnerability. Mm. We're so, we're so tiny, like we're, we're so proud, I think, in the world of all the things we build houses and cities and internet and send people into space and you know, mm. it's really easy to get, look at how powerful we are, but, but very deep down we also know that we're so totally not in control of anything and we're not in control of the really big things like getting sick or dying or huge circumstances changing around us, all of those kind of things. So I'm feeling enormously grateful for Rumi's reminder that we, that we have to know, it seems to me really important that we know that where I end is not the sum of it, everything. Mm. We have to know that there's something other that's not me and yet also isn't separate from me, something, the, the something from which we come. So when he says, um, oh, where is it? Let us, um, we, we are like rain splashing on a roof. Let us find our way down the spout. Mm -hmm. That. And, um, most of that sense of us being being the um, outflowings or the outpourings of something that's not us that brought, brings all of this forth is missing. And I know that when I forget it, that's when I'm at my most yeah. terrified. And that's why I love, let us find our courage and join the lions this way. So I'm really feeling moved, really touched by this and emboldened by it as well. Mm. Yeah, I love the order of it as well in that that comes toward the end and it feels like the invitation from Rumi is speaking of the beyond and then coming right back into what could be right here like finding our courage and joining the lions and almost employing the thing we learned earlier in the poem, which is that there is this beyond that is our true nature or our true essence that's deeply supportive of and required for in some ways to find our courage and join the lions. So it's like he, he speaks of, maybe you could liken it to kind of personality and essence and how infused together it's possible to have that courage. But when we think we are the smallness that you're talking of, Justin, and we forget that we are greater than our fear and smallness, and that there isn't some beautiful, essential, faithful something in support of us that's available to us because we are a being, it does feel impossible and we do feel like mice and we do feel afraid. And this, this poem in a way, as I'm seeing it now is testament to also how, how we need, I need, one needs maybe to feel this support also in a marriage. It's why we had it at our wedding, which is, you know, the lines, these two gardens may be beautiful, but let us pass beyond them and go to the gardener. It's like at the time of getting married, maybe it's all rosy and romantic or something. And it's inevitable that we're going to need to find something other than just the way that we think each other's cool or something. Because life is going to happen 
inside of the marriage and and outside of it and we're gonna hit different places and to have a a way of seeing that includes the gardener i.e not just the gardens that got made you and i but who made us what made us what we are well what where we came from to find a way of being in contact with that and i don't know i can't remember i think in the ceremony there was also a part about god being included in a marriage we got, we got married in a church and having that interestingly the third space as i relate to that I don't know what it is, a field, a something that is life-giving, that is alive and generous and wise and benevolent, ever benevolent, to bring contact with that into a marriage, a friendship, a business, a relationship to self, feels like what this invitation is. And as, as Rumi says, there's no avoiding pain or feeling exiled. Like that's not going to happen. Like you can't get around it. You know, one of our other sources was around the, the humanity of suffering. Like it's just anyone who's being honest knows that we're going to hurt. Things are going to be tricky and it's not straightforward. And so the necessity of being in contact with this faith, with this whatever whatever it is it could be love even it could be creation and i'm sure all the faiths call it all different words but for me it's a something that's that's bigger than beyond deeper than my habitual sense of myself that leads me into a different kind of journey holds me in in my different kind of journey of faith and not taking what I say or feel as the truth as well, you know, giving myself some distance between what, what my version of events might be and what might be actually really happening and letting that be a question forever so that I'm not sure of everything or anything even and learning to accept that openness and that faithfulness as that, that field being allowed in rather than my surety or my certainty shutting it out and my opinion being the thing that matters the most about who I am, what I'm capable of, who other people are, what the world is capable of doing. But allowing this, this journey to infuse all of my certainty in a way so that this um, invisible one or the painter might also have a life in my life rather than anything else being pushed away because I have to kind of keep this under control or something. Hmm. One of the things that I'm, I'm um, reflecting on when you were talking about hmm. God and church, I was, I was thinking about how, what, what a mess we've got ourselves into in our culture at this time about all of this. So first of all, um, Rumi in his poem uses lots of different words for this something that you're talking about that's beyond us. None of which, by the way, are God. He talks about the gardener, the river flowing towards the ocean, the invisible one, the painter, the spout, the target, beauty. So we have, we have a problem, I think many of us have a problem, because there's this word that's been um, appropriated by organized religion, which is God, that might be connected to what Rumi is talking about and to what you're talking about, which has all kinds of um, unhelpful connotations, like the one who's in charge, the one who tells us what to do, ruler or king or, you know, male words as well. So that's one trouble we have. And another trouble that we have is we live in a time 
well, we're in a sort of another upheaval about all of this, I think, right at the moment. But we live in a time which has um, roundly said, well, uh, logic and rationality are the only true things. And so you ought to dismiss all of that as controlling mumbo jumbo. And, and one of the consequences of that has been, and I think this is one of the things that I get to feel in myself sometimes is, either that means I'm lost in a cold, uncaring universe and I'm just going to be buffeted about and there's only me, or I have to be God. So I have to be, I think this is a real perilous trap, I have to be the one who is in control of everything. And, and mostly when I'm very afraid, I notice that I'm afraid because I get that I'm not the one who's in control of everything, but I feel like I ought to be. Mm. And so in the absence of having some sense that there is something other than me that is big enough to include everything and all of us and from which everything comes, mm. the gardener or the painter or the invisible one, or when, when we don't allow ourselves to have a deep sense of that, I think, mm. I think we're in really big trouble. We're certainly in really big trouble the moment that we reach the limit of our own capacity to be in charge. So we can kind of manage without it for a while and then someone gets ill or like you're saying, Lizzie, we founded a marriage or relationship based upon what I like about the other person. You make me feel happy or you're beautiful or you know we like doing the same things and that changes mm. and the other person isn't that. And all of a sudden, what I wanted is no longer in my grasp. Mm -hmm. And unless we can have, uh, this is why I think Rumi says, it's so beautiful. He says, um, it's best to travel with companions on this perilous journey. It's a really perilous journey to find the courage to allow ourselves to, to um, open beyond our own uh, need to be the one who's in charge and to have the world just the way I like it, which isolates us so much and makes us so afraid, unless it's all going really well, in which case sometimes we feel like and it's perilous because everything that we thought that we relied on may get taken away from us. And then the question is, is there anything else we can rely on? And as you keep on bringing so central to this conversation, we actually can't do that alone. But the only way that we find out, what, well, one of the very powerful ways that we find out that there's something from which we are all coming that we can rely on is to look into the eyes of another human being and to see in them what is so hard to see in ourselves that is the same, but is like I look at you and I can see you're not me, and yet we clearly are a shared something. Yeah. I'm thinking now of just in the St. Francis and the Sow poem about the, the receiving of somebody's essence and the source that we talked about last week, where inside of that relationship, maybe the painter is included when the, the seeing of one another's essence happens so in the practice of seeing one another in the practice of appreciating the essentialness the goodness the good intentions of others it's like we naturally invite what the source is what the painter is what the invisible one is what the spout is and i've no idea in a way whether that's true or not in terms of factualness but to me like when I when I feel into the gift of that like the gift of me receiving you because I see you coupled with the gift of your feeling of being seen and, and the kind of the flow that happens because of that thing it feels to me one of the greatest connections into the beyond that I know how to participate in. And of course, it could happen with a tree or a blade of grass or a flower. 
and a dog and a cat and a little rat running across the road. You know, it's like there is life, like where there is life, there is the possibility for this. this to be invited in. And so for me, the reminder of what it means to wake up, this poem is called Wake Up Lovers. Us waking up to one another, to other beings, other beings waking up to us and being in relationship with life in wakefulness, as opposed to taking for granted or being numb to or in denial about it feels like to live a life of continually asking the question about waking up and connection and connection to something beyond and having faith it's like it in the moment now describing it, it makes me feel like I can breathe and the constriction of feeling frightened and small and inadequate and unable feels like my kind of my body gets kind of small and and I I end up like the little mouse when really the the magnitude of a life just by being in relationship to who's here what's here is so much bigger is so much more expansive and flexible and agile and vibrant so to be infused with this this poem to be to let it breathe into me to let it flow into my awareness and my consciousness and my body and my breathing feels like a liberating inviting interesting compelling mysterious journey Hmm. So interesting, whilst you're talking, interesting to me, feeling the warmth and beauty of the invitation that you're making as you speak this way. I'm thinking about politics. And the, the, the way in which I'm thinking about politics is this, is that um, seems to me right at this time, this date, where are we in August? 2018 when we're making this we're having this conversation we're living in a time when the flow of politics in lots of places in the world including right where we are is going in a very different direction to this it's going into the it's going towards the direction of um each of us is um small and afraid and we need to get exactly what we want and no one else can be in it with us and we're in the politics of separation from one another so i look at you and i'm encouraged by our politics either to go well you're just like me in which case you're one of my crowd or you're different from me in which case i need to be afraid and i need to do everything i can to have you go away whether that's my um, saying things about the way that you dress or your culture or stopping you from coming into my country or, you know, and that that comes from a, all of that. It's it, what I'm learning from Rumi and from you, Lizzie, is that that I think comes from our sense of being um, separate from the world. It taps us into our frightened I'm basically on my own. There's nothing I can have faith in apart from the people who I know without any question will stand up for exactly what I want and exactly what I think at any moment in time who are my crowd. And that when we allow ourselves to do what you're saying, which is, for example, to see in another, to really see and feel in another the, the beautiful shared something from which we both come, and when we can do the same with a tree or a fox or a bird or a mountain or a city or a, we can, we can start to, um, we can start to open ourselves to a different kind of faith. And the faith is not that I'll have things just the way that I want it or that I'll be physically safe. Like, 
I have to have the world just right so that I have exactly what I want all the time and I never have to feel afraid. We can start to open to, we're part, we're part, we are just mostly participants in something way bigger than ourselves and our job is to take care of, I think this is the part I'm getting to, it, it awakens us to coming out into the world and to taking care of one another and to taking care of the whole something that we're all part of. Mm. And I wonder if that's why Rumi says we have to travel with other people. Only love can lead the way. We have to stop staying at home scared like mice and, and find our courage and not just wait around hoping that one day everything will feel okay. And then the journey home is letting our souls turn into a mirror longing. I'm going to say this more clearly. Let our souls turn into a mirror longing to reflect the essence of beauty mm. right now what we're doing is a pretty good job at reflecting all kinds of other essences in our culture we're doing really well at re reflecting the essence of hate and distrust and terror and um all of that yeah mm. Yeah, it feels like to, be, to become a soul that turns into a mirror, longing to reflect the essence of beauty, requires us to be open to that beauty. And it's so easy to get swallowed up in, as you say, all of the politics and the disastrousness and and it comes from a place of care that we do get swallowed up in it. And it comes from a place of care that I get addicted to scrolling through my newsfeed to find more disasters that are going on. And, and it's important that I read that and I know that. But it's so easy to forget all of this, all of the mystery of it all whilst being taken by the things, the world, this world that we so care about. And so I feel like what I want to be an advocate for is, is like the intertwining of these things, like not putting politics down and at the same time not putting the painter down. But what if I can bring the painter to politics and the politics to the painter? I'm feeling like I could be a weaver of things, which takes huge skill. I mean, it's so difficult to be in the domain of a debate about politics with someone and remember the painter. Like that seems to me like a lifetime beyond that even work. And yet, what if I could have practices that leave me further in contact with this so that when I do face these things, these debates, these chances to vote for something or not, or participate in whatever way I can in caring for the world, all of this could be included. You know, I could be in a conversation for what I really think is important in the world whilst being in contact with this part and not just my agenda. And as you say, not just what I want, but holding the possibility of something greater, something wider than just me winning or you winning. And maybe the contact with this, what Rumi's pointing to and what, I personally can feel so strongly is that there is a third space. There is a third part that is beyond the polarities that we, that we feel as personalities. It's beyond the right and wrong. It's beyond the good and bad. It's beyond my opinion of things and your opinion of things, something else. And if we can soften into that, as well as have the debate, as well as talk to each other, as well as communicate and let it infuse our communication and infuse our care for one another, no matter what our views are, that would be such a different world, wouldn't it? Yeah. And when we're in a marriage or a friendship or a, any other kind of relationship and we're in trouble and afraid or feeling insistent can we do the same 
can yeah. we feel our way into the this this line it, right in the middle I wonder if Rumi wrote this intentionally in this way everything is painted everything yeah. is painted with the brush of the invisible one let us follow the hidden signs and find the painter so that's that's the move mm. I think that um, we've been talking about all along that al allows us it's not just a conceptual move, although sometimes that's very helpful if I'm in disagreement with you and we're both ends of different ends of the polarity of wondering what's the something that yet includes both ends. It's not just that, it's also knowing that, um, I suppose this thing that I stumble on every now and again, which you hinted at or talked about earlier, which is, um, I can only be here and each of us I can only be here because there's an entire mysterious something going on that gave rise to there being stars and planets, oceans and skies, the beginning of life, reproduction, all of that down through billions and billions and billions of years that allow me to be here. So the moment I think that I'm I'm in charge of all of this and I'm meant to have it all my own way is the moment I've lost contact with that. And we, when we can find our way back. Yeah, I've been, um, I've talked about this a tiny little bit here, but a lot with you, Lizia. I've been swimming every day recently in the ponds up on Hampstead Heath. And I slip into the water and it's like, I remember this. So I think this is the main reason why I do this is I realize that I'm no different to the ducks and the fish. And... Mm. But the other day I was swimming early, uh, pretty much before anyone else was there. And the sun comes over at a steep angle in the morning and reflects off the water onto the undersides of the trees that are mm. around the pond. And so mm. all the trees are shimmering with reflected sunlight. So first of all, it's just beautiful. But second of all, I, I suddenly got briefly when I was in the pond earlier in the week that um, that's what we are with a reflected sunlight on the underside of the trees. And when we know ourselves that way, one of the questions we can ask is what's the sun? Mm. It was such a relief to know myself this way and to know ourselves this way, that we are the outflowings or the, the expression of something, not the, not the something itself in and of itself. We're not that we're not the end of it mm. or the all of it. Yeah. I'm really appreciating Justin. I'm feeling really moved by everything that you're saying and this, everything is painted with a brush of the invisible one. You know, when I combine that with your reflection about the sun on the trees and the shimmering and the, you're no different to the ducks and the fish thing. It feels like I'm, I'm part of this and I know lots of other people have this too, of feeling like we're special. We're exiled, particularly, as in we're not included in that part of life that other people have or the bit that I want is not available to me or something or that I'm on the outside of a social circle or I can never get in that that feeling of of exile and when I heard you say everything is painted with the brush of the invisible one and imagined you in the pond I felt this big rush of well I'm painted with the brush of the invisible one like whatever my circumstances are I'm not excluded from this thing called life whatever my personality is doing to have me feel different or special or exiled or outside of or separate from. There's a deeper truth than that available. And it's shown to us through the refracting sun on the trees, through the way a pond feels on our skin, through the way somebody holds us, you know, a hundred different opportunities a day or more as, as an offering into this field that we're talking about this this something that's holding me all the time 
and yet I make up a thousand different stories to feel like it's not. I'm not included in it. I'm not held in it. I'm not painted by it. I'm different somehow when actually, yes, I'm like the fish in the ducks. And how glorious it feels to be like the fish in the ducks and also how much of an agenda I have to not be like the fish in the ducks. <laughs> and so just relaxing into that invitation of the inclusion of being painted by the invisible one and that I could, I could live into that feeling ever more deeply every day of following the signs to feel into the painter. If I am painted, what am I, what am I painted by? So I'm just feeling really warmed and also quite excited, actually, mm. of this feeling. I think that's a really beautiful place for us to end. Mm. There's always much more to say. <laughs> Yeah, of course. So I want to say thank you to you, Lizzie, and uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Justin. See you next week.